in our culture, we don't have a clear line or an event or a rite of passage for when a boy becomes a man. This leads to many boys struggling and trying to figure out when and how or even if they have actually become men. A rite of passage is a powerful experience from a young man and his father that invites the boy into his journey of manhood. My guest today is Stephen Arms, and he's a leading expert in this subject. In his book, Milestone to Manhood, Stephen shares his firsthand experience of his own rite of passage weekend, and he reflects on how it shaped him into the man that he is today. His book also provides other men with the framework of how to hold their own rite of passage weekend for their sons. It's a great conversation for all fathers of boys. So let's get started. Hey, Stephen, thanks for being here today. I'm looking forward to have our, our conversation here. We, we have an important topic and uh, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on our show, Warren. Yeah, for sure. So what we're talking about is this idea of rite of passage. So I'd love to start just definitionally. When, when people hear that phrase, different things might come to mind. So from your perspective, as an expert on this, somebody who's written on this and talked about this, what is a rite of passage? A rite of passage is an event that a boy can look back on in his life and say, that was the moment that I became a man. When we look at other cultures from around the world, we see these examples of rite of passage events. The most famous is probably in the Jewish faith, they have the bar mitzvah. That's how a Jewish boy achieves the status of man. It's a very clear event in his life that he knows after the bar mitzvah, I'm a man. Um, other examples of a rite of passage would be the uh, walkabout in Australian Aboriginal society. And in that rite of passage, being a tribal society, the boy is sent off into the wilderness for three to six months at a time. And when he comes back, he's no longer considered to be a boy but he's considered to be a man and he's el eligible for marriage. Our modern Western culture, we don't really have an equivalent coming of age rite of passage event. And I think that that's one reason why we see uh, men, well, well, adult males, we'll call them, who are acting like boys, right? Yeah. Because they've never been properly initiated into man, into manhood. They've never had a rite of passage event because our culture doesn't have one anymore. I love that. And, and there are a couple things in there that I want to I want to dig into a little bit. You, you just mentioned even right there in, into manhood on your on your website. You got a bunch of great articles. One of them in there has a line talking about the difference between adulthood and manhood. Yeah. So and, and that kind of ties into what you were just saying. You're going to become an adult. That That's just time. That's just age. You go around the sun enough. You're an adult. So so um, I love that article. I'd, I'd like to have you expand on that a little bit. What is the difference between adulthood and manhood? Just so, just some of your thoughts on that. Why is that relevant? Why do we need to be think? What should we be thinking about that? So what, what, what about that? Legal adulthood, like you say, uh, comes at, comes at a certain age in our country. You're an adult when you become 18, but what we see is there's lots of legal adults who are not acting like men. Right. Um, Manhood has a lot more to do with behavior and spiritual development, whereas adulthood has to do with your age. So do we see a lot of men in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who are legal adults, but they act like boys? You know, there's lots of examples. You know, I could talk about politicians or movie actors. I mean, in every facet of our culture, we see these examples of grown adult males who they're adults, but they're not really men. On the other hand, you know, what we're talking about here, rites of passage, especially around the age of 13 years old, a, a 13 year old can be a man, but not an adult. So he's been properly initiated. If he's properly initiated into manhood and he's spiritually mature, then he can, he can be in a, a man while not yet being a legal adult. There's lots of 13 year old boys who are more spirit are more spiritually developed than maybe a 20 or 30 year old who's living in mom's basement, looking at pornography, doesn't want to get a job, doesn't want to provide uh, for a family, you know? Um, so 
that's the difference between manhood and adulthood. Yeah. And and how does during during a rite of a rite of passage, and and I know we'll get into this more as we go, but how, how what what sort of framework do you have? How does that how does that happen? People, you know, that they're with you, like, okay, we need some some sort of thing. We're not gonna send our son to spend three or six months walking around in the Rocky Mountains. We're not gonna do that. Like we're not in the Jewish faith here, so we don't have the bar mitzvah. So what is it actually, let's start to get into it. What does it actually look like? What's the framework or the steps or the process that that you recommend as a rite of passage? That's that Warren, what you just asked, that's the million dollar question, because mm-hmm. I think people nowadays, they see the benefit of holding a rite of passage, but they're like, well, what does that look like nowadays? You know, as you said, we're not Jewish, so we're not going to have a bar mitzvah for our sons. We don't live in a tribal society. So as cool as it would be to send a boy off into the wilderness <laughs> for three months, that's not really going to help him develop into a man today because we don't live in a tribal society. So what does that look like? What should a rite of passage today look like? Well, I'll start by saying that when I was 13, I'm, I'm 33 years old now. So 20 years ago, when I was 13, my dad took me out on a rite of passage. And it wasn't just my dad. It was also the close male role models in my life. So my grandfather and two of my uncles came as well. Um, And they developed a rite of passage weekend that kind of became a family tradition that all of my younger brothers and my younger male cousins got as well. So I'm happy to share the rite of passage that I experienced at 13 years old, um, what they developed for me. Uh, And that's what we talk about in the book is we share our family story But then it's also a how-to guide of how to organize a rite of passage for your son. Um, That being said, could you do other things for your rite of passage? Does your rite of passage have to look exactly like mine? No, of course not. You know, the rite of passage should be modified and customized for your own unique family, for your own unique son. That being said, um, I can kind of dive into what our weekend looked like. Um, Yeah, yeah, please do. So yeah, as I, as I was talking about earlier, it's not just the, the boy's father who attends, but it's also other important male role models too. And, uh, the reason for that is, you know, absolutely dad is the most important male role model in a boy's life. You know, he's what, what you're looking, what he's, you are what he's looking up to every day about what it means to be a man. But that being said, around the age of 13, there's also kind of this tension that develops between father and son, right? Um, the boy wants to gain more independence. He wants to spread his wings. So he doesn't always necessarily listen to what dad has to say, but by getting other men involved in your son's weekend, then it helps to break through to him in a way that he might actually listen. So one of the guys might give him a piece of advice that you as dad have been saying for the last two years, you know, you need to make your bed every morning. You need to make your bed every morning, but, and you know, the son doesn't listen because that's what 13 year old boys do. But then another man might share that same exact piece of advice during the weekend. And it's like a light bulb goes off in your son's mind, right? Oh, I've never thought about that before. I should give that a shot, you know? Yeah. So that's why it's important to get other men involved is because it helps to break through to your son in a way that he might actually listen. Another uh, important part of the weekend is that an element of separation, right? Getting the boy out of his normal day-to-day routines and taking him into a new environment. So for me, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. My rite of passage was held at Lake Shasta, which is in way Northern California, about three hours away. Um, So we took a road trip to get there. We're out in the wilderness in a cabin, uh, very remote. And the purpose of this is to you know, just as your son is venturing into new territory, becoming, he's never become a man before. This is all new experiences for him. Well, his rite of passage should reflect that. If you hold the rite of passage, you know, in mom's basement at home, then there's this tendency to, you know, well, there's nothing really too special about this, but Mm, if you get him out of, you want to get him out of his normal day-to-day routines and separate him to show, you know, this is a milestone in your life. You are officially becoming a man. So you want to make it um, as 
as special as possible. And one way to do that is, is by taking him to a, a remote location. You know, we always felt like getting out in nature, uh, there's something about it as men, you know, it's challenging, it's very, uh, physical, you know? So, uh, we always encourage people to, to go out into nature, um, you know, not get a hotel in Vegas or something like that. Right. That's oh, that yeah, yeah, yeah. appropriate <laughs> for this type of weekend. Right. Um, and then the last part of it is there should be rituals, you know, and the importance of rituals is that it adds context and meaning to the weekend. So, you know, if you put a group of five guys at a cabin at Lake Shasta with fishing poles, there's this tendency to just go fishing the whole weekend and not talk about anything that's important, right? Because talking about things that are important, talking about what it means to be a man, talking about your faith and sharing your faith journey with your son, talking about your strengths and your weaknesses as a man and how you could be a better man yourself. Those things require intimacy and that's not easy. So the purpose of the rituals is to give the group exercises for, for the men to go through to help facilitate healthy conversation. That's really going to help your son as he enters into manhood, you know, uh, so what are, so what are the rituals that, uh, we outline in the book? Well, the first ritual is an entrance ceremony. So just like you in a, in a wedding or in a high school graduation, there's a formal entrance ceremony, right? And the purpose of this is that it, it gives the event a formal beginning, you know, um, in a graduation ceremony, you have this procession, you have special music, and that shows that, you know, the graduation is officially beginning. It, it's all meant to encourage, it's all meant to solidify the fact that uh, this is a big deal and this is not something to be taken lightly. So by having a formal entrance ceremony, um, it's making it super clear to your son that this is a rite of passage. And at the end of this rite of passage, you will be considered to be a man in this family as well. So our our entrance ceremony um, involved, uh, you know, a group prayer. Um, we read from scripture in the book of Exodus, the passage of Moses encountering God in the form of the burning bush. And there's a few reasons why that passage itself is uh, appropriate for a boy's rite of passage ceremony. But one element of it that I would like to focus on is the fact that Moses encounters God in the form of fire. So fire represents the Holy Spirit. It's a symbol of uh, God's presence. Moses encounters God in the form of a burning bush. So, and after we read that passage, the boy is tasked with lighting a fire uh, inside the, the cabin. And his challenge for the weekend is to keep that fire going throughout the entire time mm. to never let it become fully extinguished. That's the boy's challenge for his rite of passage is to light the fire and to keep it going. And the the reason for this is that it shows, as I said, fire is a symbol of God's presence. So by ha keeping the fire going during the weekend, you're including a physical reminder that God is with us. God is with the group here during this weekend, but also showing your son that the your your faith life is going to require work right you're going to have to add fuel to that flame it's your relationship with god is not going to happen passively it's going to happen actively you have to feed your your faith sometimes your faith is going to be hotter and sometimes it's going to be colder that's just a part of life but what's most important is that you never let that flame of faith become fully extinguished so that was one of the, so that's the entrance ceremony. That's kind of the first formal ritual of the weekend. Um, and then it goes on from there with uh, other rituals. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that. That's a, that's a great, that's a great thing, especially giving guys the something to think about in terms of like a graduation, as you mentioned, there's there, you, you enter into that, you have the processional in front of it or, or a wedding you, you have the formality of a wedding, like nobody's confused about what a wedding is. We, we know where we're going. We know what's going to happen. We have the music that begins. And, and so, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great way to, to start that process. Um, 
you mentioned your book there. There's a great line in your in your book. Um, I wrote this one down, and and you talked about how this is sort of in the context of comparing uh, a rite of passage with the Sweet Sixteen birthday party, which is yeah. something that is that's pretty common in our culture. But one of one of the things you have in there as a line is it's all party and no actual challenge. I, I like that line a lot, but but I'd love to have you dig into that and explain that because people might think, well, we had this big party. My, my son, my daughter, my, my child turned 16. We had a big party. All the friends came over. So I, I like that though. I think I know where you're going with that. And I like it. It's all party and no challenge. So why is the challenge relevant? Just, just dig into that line a little bit for us. Yeah, absolutely. So any rite of passage event, whether it's the bar mitzvah, whether it's the, the walkabout, um, whether it's the, the rite of passage that we outline in Milestone to Manhood, there's going to be three elements to any rite of passage event. So the first element is a separation. The th second element is a challenge. And the third element is a reincorporation back into, into the family. So let's look at, just for example, the bar mitzvah. So there, the first element is separation. The boy goes up in front of the congregation, he's separated, he has to lead the service for the first time in his life. The second element is a challenge. The challenge is that he he reads from the Torah, not in his, in his native tongue, but in Hebrew. And then he has to give an intellectual reflection on it. That's the boy's challenge. The third element is this reincorporation back into the family. So the boy, when, when his challenge is done, the ceremony is over, they throw a big party, right? And it's a celebratory thing. They, the boy, they put the boy on a chair. There's lots of dancing. There's lots of food. They put the boy on the chair and the men in the group literally lift him up. I'm sure you've seen it at weddings or other, you know, um, celebrations. They put the boy on the chair and the men lift him up over their head showing, you know, here's the men lifting the boy up his status. He's no longer a boy. Now he's been lifted up into a man and they're celebrating, right? So, those are the those are going to be the three elements of any rite of passage. That's what we see in the walkabout. There's an element of separation. I mean, the boy is literally sent off into the yeah. wilderness. Yeah. So that's talk about separation there. Yeah. There's a challenge. You know, you got to survive on yourself by yourself for three months, and then he's reincorporated back into the family. So the the as you talked about a sweet sixteen. That's probably the equivalent the closest thing that we have nowadays to a rite of passage event would be a sweet 16. and what is a sweet 16 nowadays when i think of sweet 16 i think about a pool party a dj food girls in bikinis like that to me is what a sweet 16 party has become and if you look at it like there's no element of separation there's no challenge involved in it and it's all, but there is the third element, right? There is the celebration part of it, but that doesn't do anything to actually prepare that boy to enter into manhood, right? Nothing yeah. about it has has impressed on his mind. Oh, now I'm a, now I am a man now just because I had some pool party at 16 years old. The sweet 16 is not a rite of passage because it doesn't have that separation and it doesn't have that challenge. And what I would argue is that. What happens if a boy doesn't have a rite of passage? He doesn't have that element of separation and that element of challenge. Maybe he only experiences uh, a sweet 16, which is the, the celebratory part of it. What What is that boy going to do? Well, he's never been formally initiated into manhood. He's never had to go through some sort of challenge to prove his manhood. So what is he going to do? He's going to try to, he's going to, come up with his own challenges to try to prove his manhood to himself. And mm -hmm. when a 16-year-old boy tries to come up with his own challenges to prove his manhood, they're more most likely going to be bad yeah, bad challenges, right? Bad yeah. decisions. So what Are could we, that look like? There's usually a police officer involved. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, what, what could, could that, that look, look like? like? Yeah. Well, yeah. one would be I would say the sexual conquest of women. Mm -hmm. You hear guys say things like she made a man out of me, right? Because they're trying to prove their manhood by yeah. sleeping around with as many women as possible. 
or it could be getting into fights. You know, what is violence other than one man trying to prove his superior dominance over another man, trying to prove his manhood by saying, well, if I can physically dominate this other man, then I must be a man myself. I would say another one nowadays, another challenge that boys are are entering into, whether subconsciously or consciously, to try to prove their manhood to themselves, I would say is video game addictions. Mm. You know, video games nowadays, you can literally slay a dragon or kill a terrorist. This totally plays into the male ego of proving yourself as a warrior, proving yourself as a man. So in the absence of a father giving his son a challenge, a formal rite of passage event, not a sweet 16 party, because that's not a rite of passage. In the absence of a father giving this to his son, the boy is going to try to create his own rite of passage one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And those, those are great examples. It's usually not going to go well. Every one of us listening, you know, our, our show is for Christian men. We've all gone through that teenage time. We've all been there. So when you mention, you know, you're 16 years old and it's up to you, how are you going to prove that you're a man? Usually we're not coming out of that with, with great positive examples of <laughs> what it is that we're going to do. So yeah, I, I like, I like what you were sharing there. I like those examples quite a lot. I do want to go back to something you mentioned earlier. You talked about how uh, for you guys, you you went out in nature, you went out to the to the cabin. Um, I do something similar. I, I lead I lead events for men up here in the mountains in Colorado. We're not in a hotel. We're not in downtown Denver or anything like that. I think it's great to get men out in nature. I think we belong there. Some guys can't do that. You know, they they live in a city. They don't have the financial means. They don't have the ability to get there. So what would you recommend for a man uh, who wants to do something like this for his son, but you know, maybe he lives downtown Chicago or LA or New York and, and he just do doesn't really have the means of getting just, you know, him and his son or, you know, other people, he doesn't have the ability to do it. So we don't want him to be left out of the equation. So what, what could he do as, you know, option number two, what, what are some choices for him? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say don't let perfection be the enemy of progress, right? Just because you can't do the perfect rite of passage, don't let that mean that you're not going to do a rite of passage at all. Yeah. So the the scenario that you've proposed, what I would say to that man is hold a rite of passage event for him, get other men involved for his for your son's rite of passage so that it's not just dad, get two or three or four other men whether they're from your family, you know, your brothers-in-law, your father-in-law, your your own dad yourself, or you get men from your church, right? Close, close male role models that the boy already knows and hold the rite of passage at one of those other men's houses, right? Don't hold your rite of passage at the house that your your son grew up in, right? Because if you do that, there's no element of separation. It's yeah. just a day at the house, right? Get the boy out of his house, out of his away from his mother get him out of his normal comfort zones and bring him to a place where he's you know not totally comfortable you know uh so i would say get one of have one of the other men um sponsor and host your son's rite of passage yep. event at their houses that's, that is that's great that's great because because i know i know we've got a lot of guys listening and and they say yeah, i'd love to go to a lake three hours and away in California, or I'd love to go up into the mountains, you know, where you, where you, where you had yours, where I like, I'd love to do that stuff. I just don't have the ability and I don't want them. Like you said, don't, don't have perfection in your mind, keep you from doing this stuff. So that, that's a great, that's a great idea, a great way to go. Yeah. One of the other things you, that, that I want to make sure we touch on, we we've, we've mentioned the, the age 13, a couple of times we yeah. talked about sweet 16 as well, but the age 13, so what's the, what's the reason for 13? Why, why is that your suggested age? There's a few reasons why we find that 13 is the ideal age for a rite of passage event. The first is that, well, it mimics what we see in other cultures when they're doing their rite of passage. The bar mitzvah happens at 13 years old. Another reason is that your son is officially becoming a teenager. So it's a milestone birthday for him. It's already probably a pretty big deal in his mind, whether he tells you that or not, you know, 
he's yeah. no longer a kid anymore, but now yeah. he's a teenager. So yeah. he's already pretty excited about that. And then another reason is that we find that 13 is kind of that sweet spot where the boy is old enough to understand some of the advice about manhood that you're giving him, but he's still young enough to be receptive to unsolicited advice from adult males. So by the time a boy is 17, 18, 19 years old, he doesn't really, he thinks he pretty much knows everything at that mm -hmm. point and doesn't yeah. really take advice from, from yeah. elders. Right. But at 13, he's still open to, to that wisdom and that advice that you're sharing with him. Now, 10, 11 years old, he's probably too young to, to really understand what's going on. A lot of it's going to go over his head. So 13 is kind of that sweet spot. Now, if you have a son who's 14, 15, even 16 years old, I don't think it's too late to hold a rite of passage for him. But by the time a boy is 18, 20, 21, I, I do think the ship has sailed and it could actually come off as kind of demeaning. You know, if you have a 21 year old son and you say, Hey, I just want to let you know, like now I consider you to be a man it, as you know, I, I could imagine myself hearing that I would feel like, well, I've been a man for three yeah. years, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. so, so there's yeah. a, a right time in a boy's life to do this. And there's a wrong time in a boy's life to do this. And yeah. we do, we do have some people say, Hey, you know, isn't 13 pretty young to initiate a boy into manhood? I mean, can, can a 13 year old really be a man? And we say that it's better to initiate your son into manhood too early rather than a little bit too late. Because if you wait until a boy if is 18 years old and you haven't held a rite of passage for him, like we were talking about earlier, he's going to go through his teenage years trying to prove his manhood to himself. So it's better to initiate him on the early side rather than on the late side. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. Because I, I know people were, are, are thinking about that. They're like, well, why 13? But like you said, if, if the boy's 10 or 11 years old, can't quite process exactly what's going on yet. If the boy's 21, he's like, dude, I've been a man, you know? So, so yeah, that, that makes sense that, that, um, that that's a good, a good target to be aiming for. Something else that you talked about earlier, just in passing, you, you brought up the question that, that that we and and we all thought this as as young guys as well and and some of us still think about it is the question of what does it mean to be a man so why is that question central to the idea of rite of passage because we could talk about hey you know now you've got responsibilities we we could be a, a lot more literal you you we have to talk about how do you pay bills how do you balance a checkbook nobody writes checks anymore, but you know, how do you, how do you balance your bank accounts and how do you, how do you get a mortgage? Like we, we could talk about sort of those things, but why is it that that bigger picture question of what does it mean to be a man? Why is that a central point here instead of more maybe of the practical advice? Yeah. So, well, I'll say that we already talked about the first ritual, which is the entrance ceremony. Mm -hmm. Well, the second ritual that falls, follows up to the entrance ceremony is literally a discussion about what it means to be a man. So the, the men in the group, we all sit down in a circle, five or six of us, and each man is given five or 10 minutes to share with the boy what it means to be a man. And the reason that it's important to talk to your son about what it means to be a man is that it's a way to counteract what the culture at large is telling your son what it means to be a man. So the internet, television, his friends at school, they're all influencing him in one way or another, for better or for worse, about what does it mean to be a man nowadays? You know, yeah. is a man someone who sits back passively and lets things happen, lets things go downhill without doing something about it? Or is a man someone who fights for what is right? Is a man someone who is angry and aggressive all the time? No, it's not that. Is a man someone who's passive and addicted to his phone? No, it's not that either. It's somewhere in the middle, right? It's someone who um, is a physical protector and a provider. That's definitely what a man has to be. But a man also has to be in touch with his emotions and has to be a good communicator, right? If a boy enters into manhood, 
and cannot control his emotions, well, that marriage is not going to go very well. So yeah. men, what it means to be a man, I would say one thing is that men have to have balance. You know, on one side, we do have to be protectors and providers. And in that regard, you have to be a, a little bit aggressive to, to be able to pr do those things. On the other hand, you have to be tender. You have to be a good emotional provider for your family as well. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a big part of the weekend is kind of counteracting what the culture at large is going to tell your son what it means to be a man. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it, it really is a critical question. And, and I, I think there are probably some men who listen and they would hear, you know, if I have to spend the weekend talking with my son about what it means to be a man, I'm a little bit hesitant of that because I don't know, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I mentioned I lead, I lead men's events. So I have, I've men come here, you know, 30, 40, 50 years old, a lot of them are still struggling is I don't know the answer to that question myself. And, and I think in big part, some of that is because they never had a rite of passage. They never had anyone teach them. And so they're learning from culture. They're learning this, like what you're describing. And so they're a little bit hesitant on how do I go teach my son what it means to be a man when it's a question I still struggle with myself. And so I think it's great that you have that as an emphasis point that you talk about in your book and with some of the answers that, you know, that, that you're sharing here. I think that's really important because as guys, we don't like going into a scenario if we don't really know how it's going to go. Like it, we, we don't know the outcome. And so it, it's like in, in, in the legal world, you don't really want to ask a witness if you don't know the answer to the question. And so we don't like that uneasy feeling. So if we're put in a situation where it's my job to teach my son how to be a man, I'm not really sure if I'm even there yet as a man, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, ha have you talked with guys ever who have had that kind of hesitancy? They don't know that they don't know the answer themselves. So how do they impart that to their son? Yeah. Well, I'd like to add two things to the conversation. One is if that's how you are feeling as a man, a grown man, I don't know how, you know, what, how old this man is in his thirties or forties. You have a 13 year old son, so you're probably not in your twenties. Right. If you're in your 30s and 40s and you don't know what it means to be a man, well, how do you think that your 13-year-old son feels? If you don't understand what it means to be a man yourself and you've been through this for the last 20 years, you've you've been a man for the last 20 years, whether you know it or not. Yeah. Well, then what do you think how, how is your son ever going to be able to figure out what it means to be a man? He's never been a man himself. He's never been a man for a single day. So I would say one is have that perspective, right? Like this isn't just about you as the father. We all have our own challenges. None of us are perfect. That's for sure. I'm not, but that doesn't mean that you still, that doesn't mean that you just get this free pass to like say, well, I don't know what it means to be a man. I was never, I never had a rite of passage or maybe my own father wasn't in the picture. Therefore I'm just going to let the culture at large tell my son what it means to be a man. And I get a free pass on that. Yeah. No, absolutely not. Like right. you have a responsibility as a father to help form your son into manhood. And if you're struggling with it, well, think about your son. He's probably struggling with it way more. Yeah. And the other thing I would say about it is, you know, you don't go into this weekend completely unprepared, right? You, you have to do your homework before this. So you know you're going to have a conversation, a 10 minute, 15 minute conversation with your son as a group about what it means to be a man. And you're going to have to share. So sit down, do some homework and think about, well, what does it mean to be a man? You know, right. I, I would say that most men in their thirties and forties, whether they know it or not, if they sit down and think about what does it really mean to be a man? I think that you could, you could come up with something pretty good. And my advice would be, Think about your own life and share a story about how you've been formed as a man and share that story with your son. Don't just tell him, well, a man is honest at all times. A man treats women with respect at all times. That That's true. You know, those are part of being a man is that you have to live with honesty. You have to live with integrity. A man treats women with respect at all times. That's true. Those are That's good piece of, of advice to share with your son, but also tell him a story. Maybe tell him the story yeah. about how you met his mother and how you fell in love, you know, um, that will give him context for this advice that you're sharing with him. 
as I said, your son is, he hasn't been a man for a single day in his life. But if you can share some of your wisdom, some of your life experiences, not that they have to be perfect, but share with him some of what you've been through um, to, so that he has, he can take some of that wisdom as he's entering into this new chapter himself. Yeah. Yeah. And th th those stories are, are incredibly powerful. And you just mentioned not that they have to be perfect. I would argue they're better if they're, if you're not. Yeah. Because you're, you're showing him, I'm not expecting you son to become perfect now or as a man, because I'm not. And, and uh, obviously you're talking to a 13 year old. So there, there are some things that you can't talk about because you just don't have the framework to discuss it yet, but discussing your, your struggles and your challenges and when, when, and where you weren't perfect shows him that's also part of being a man and talking about it is part of being a man. You don't hide that. You don't cover it. You don't hold it and push it down and repress it. You, you own it. You take ownership of that. You say, yeah, that, but that's part of being a man. So that that's great. Um, something you mentioned a moment ago, uh, you talked about, well, he's never been a man yet. I, I want to kind of bounce off that to a, a different question. And that, this is about moms. So um, our show is primarily for men, but we do have moms who listen. And I know we have single moms who listen. So a single mom is listening to this. She knows she's never been a man but she wants to help her son to the best of her ability as a, as the great mom that she is she's trying to do what she can but dad dad's not around for whatever reason we're not we're not even going to talk about him at all in this scenario he's just not around so she's there raising her son he's going to th turn 13 in a year or so and she's like what do what do i do so a, a mom i am of a and you you don't have to respond to this if you don't want i don't a mom in my opinion cannot do this a mom can't bestow manhood masculinity onto her son, despite her best efforts. You don't have to, you don't have to agree or respond to that, but no, I agree. Okay. So what does a mom do in that scenario? How does she, how does she fit in here? Yeah. I have so much respect for single mothers. Um, that, that exact scenario actually did occur in our family because I have a cousin, a younger cousin who is, adopted from a single mother, my aunt, she never got married. Um, and she saw the benefit of her son, my cousin having a rite of passage event. She knew that she can initiate uh, her son into manhood. And I'll talk about that for a quick second. Why can't a mother initiate a son into manhood? Well, mothers are designed by God to be nurturing towards children. Like they have the hardware that you and I, Warren, we don't have this hardware to literally nurture a child from our bodies, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, that's a, a, that is why God um, gave women, made men and women differently because women are designed to be nurturers to, to children. Um, that being said, it's a father's responsibility to at the appropriate age, help the child to create some distance between this, between his mother. Um, it, you know, I have three children myself. They're all pretty young. I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And I was there, you know, at my wife's side during the birth of all of our children. And I was the one, the doctor after the birth, the doctor hands me the scissors and I cut the umbilical cord, right? Like it's at every even at that first day of my children's life, it was my responsibility as dad to, in some small way, sever that relationship between mother and child, because it is good that mothers are nurturing and loving towards kids, right? That's, it's a beautiful thing. We need mothers. This is not a knock on mothers, right, but right, at right. some point there has to be a separation between the child and the mother. And and here, here's an example. Well, what happens if you don't? Well, if you have a son who is too emotionally tied to his mother, what happens when he gets married? When he gets married to another woman and he still emotionally has not disconnected in some way to, to his mom and he's still emotionally tied to his mom, but he's married to another woman, that marriage, that's going to create issues in that marriage, let me tell you. Yeah. So I, I'm not saying that a boy should completely sever all relationships with his mom right. and never right. talk to her again. Of course right. not. 
there has to be balance here, but there has to be, as our sons are becoming men, there has to be a healthy distance from both parents, mother and father. And it's a, it's primarily a dad's responsibility to do that. Going back to the original questions about what, what should a, a single mother uh, or a mom who wants this for her son, what should she do? I would say, get other men involved in your son's rite of passage weekend. So what did my aunt do who was in this exact situation? She had her dad, uh, our, our grandfather, organize the rite of passage for her son. So my grandfather led the weekend. Um, my dad and my other uncles were all there as kind of the male mentors. And actually, I was there. And so were some of my younger brothers, because as we talked about, once you go through this rite of passage, you are officially considered to be a man of the family. So that means that you are eligible to be one of the male mentors for your younger brothers, your younger cousins on their rite of passage. So I had a rite of passage when I was 13 years old, but I also got to go on four other ones, two, two of my younger brothers and two of my younger male cousins for their rite of passage as well. So yes, it is, it is totally, uh, it is totally possible for a single mother to have a rite of passage for her son. And the way that you would do that is to, to bring in some other man, a, a man that has a previous relationship with your son, not a complete stranger. You don't want that, yeah. of course. Yeah. You want someone who, whoever is the closest male role model, closest father figure, I would say have him lead the, the, your son's rite of passage. Yeah, that's that's excellent. That's excellent. Cause I don't, I don't want the moms to be, to be left out here. They, they, they certainly have their part to play and, and sticking with the family dynamics part of this, um, just as a, just a, a curiosity, kind of an offshoot question. What about a father leading a daughter through something like this, where we're focusing on sons, understandably, that's, that's the, that's the point of what we're talking about here. But uh, I, I know plenty of dads who only have daughters. They don't have sons. And they're like, man, I'd love to do something like this with her. Yeah. What, what about that side of the equation? So the girls in our family did have a rite of passage event. Uh, it looked very similar to the male version of the rite of passage. Uh, the biggest difference is that it's all the women of the family who take the girl away and hold a rite of passage event for her. her. They're going to talk about what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a good woman? What are the characteristic traits of a good woman? Um, they're going to share their own journeys about faith. They're going to talk about scriptures. They're going to talk about their own strengths and their weaknesses. They're going to give her family heirlooms. So there is an entire weekend that's very similar to the male version for, uh, for a girl's rite of passage event. Now, if a dad wants to get involved, I would say that the most appropriate way of doing that would be to take your daughter out uh, on a, a date, take her out to a fancy restaurant, treat her like a woman, um, have conversations that a man can have with a, a woman about what does it mean? Give her your perspective as a man. So what does what does a good man look for in a woman, right? Um, how should how should a man treat a woman um on a date you know uh you could present her with a, a ring um basically set the bar for take her out on a date on her 13 year old birthday and basically set the bar for her about well this is how my dad treated me so as she's going to you know date herself and uh look for someone to marry as she gets older, then she has something to reference back to like, well, if this guy is not treating me the way, if a guy's not treating me the way that my dad treated me, like this yeah. is, that's my bar, right? This is the minimum. So I would say if you want to do something for your daughter at 13 years old, I would encourage you to take her out on a date, have conversations with her, show her what it, how a real man should treat her, get her some gifts, you know, um, and show her, how a real man should treat a woman. Yeah. Yeah. That's excellent because I, I talk with guys plenty about how as men we're setting that standard for our daughters. And it, it's one thing to, to just talk about these things at home. It's another thing to, to walk the walk, so to speak, to, to go out and 
you open the door for her, for example, you know, the car door for her and, and you, you tell her, Hey, hang on, I'm walking around. Don't, don't get out yet. You know, like even, even things like that, you say, this is what I'm going to do. And when you come back out from the restaurant, you open the door for her and get in and then you close the door, like all of those sorts of things. So yeah, that's a great, that's a great example of, of what we can, what we can do on the other side of the equation. Um, as we start to get close to the end of our hour, one of the questions I want to I want to make sure I, I ask is what are what might be some mistakes that a, that a man might make with a rite of passage? You know, um, uh, I have some thoughts in mind and, you know, other than not doing one, we'll, we'll assume that one. We've checked that box. So that was mistake number one, not doing one. OK. Other than that, though, what, what are some mistakes, maybe some things you've seen guys do or heard stories of guys do or, or just some of your thoughts on that? What, are, what do we have to watch out for as men? We want to, you know, we're, we're guys, we want to do the best of our ability. We want to do this to the best of our ability. So what about that? One mistake I would say is uh, overthinking it, you know, having this desire for the weekend to go perfectly. You know, the weekend does uh, take quite a bit of planning. Uh, it's something that you're going to, you know, start planning a few months in advance. Uh, there's lots of people involved. So you can kind of think about the weekend a lot and think about like the conversations you want to have with your son and maybe even have expectations about how he might react to some of the things, you know, as you're giving him a family heirloom, like, well, maybe it's not as emotional of a moment as you were hoping it was. Don't let that discourage you. Um, because like, it's better to just hold the rite of passage. It's not going to be perfect. You know, it's not going to go yeah. exactly the way that you had in mind, but in some ways it's going to be better. You know, there's going to be such scenarios where like you never would have thought about that. And it, like, it just happened way better than you would have imagined. So um, once, once the ball gets rolling and the weekend kind of starts, just go with the flow, um, accept it for what it is and don't overthink it too much. Uh, other um, mistakes that guys have made, I would say, um, you know, you can go camping for your rite of passage weekend, I know dads who have done it. I've also heard that people who go camping, they regret it because there's so much involved logistically with camping as far as setting up tents, setting mm. up a kitchen, you know, fighting off wildlife during the nighttime, potentially dealing with rain. I mean, I love camping. There's nothing wrong with it. But during a rite of passage weekend, as you're trying to have these conversations with your son, going through these sharing exercises, talking about God, it can be kind of distracting, you know, when you're talking about a God in one minute and then the next minute, like your tent is falling over and you have to repitch your tent, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, um, so I, I've heard from dads who, if they were to redo it over again, they wouldn't go camping. Um, I think it would be a mistake to one thing that we encourage men to do is to, uh, we encourage the group to do meals together, you know, don't go out to a restaurant where you're going to be served, but actually cook together. Cause that's good. Yeah. Kind of like low quality, low pressure, quality time together as a group. Right. Um, that being said, you also don't want to make like gourmet meals that are going to take three hours to prepare. And then you got to get right. your dishes too. Yeah. You want to keep it pretty simple because that's not the core of the weekend. Um, so there's kind of a balance there too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So those are yeah, kind those, of some those... things that I've learned. Oh, yeah, those I are definitely that. great ones, and and I like it because they're just simple and practical as well. And that's what that's what we always like it like as guys, <laughs> right to the point. Yeah. Um. What what's something that you want to make sure we we talk about? Maybe uh maybe it's a topic we didn't get into that that we need to ensure that guys think about, or something you wanted to come back to or emphasize when it comes to this idea of rite of passage. What's a what's a last point you'd like to leave guys with? Yeah, I would just say you know. Um, the purpose of the weekend is to initiate your son into manhood. And we have these rituals that your listeners can learn more about, um, the giving of a family heirloom, which is really powerful, uh, cause you're, you're giving something that ha has maybe not necessarily mon a lot of monetary value, but a lot of emotional sentimental value, maybe something that your own father or grandfather have, has given to you. Now you're passing it down for, to your son showing him now that you're a man, you can take care of things that have value to me and I trust you. Um, it really all builds up to that last ceremony, that last ritual, which is 
the formal bestowing of the title of man. And that is really the moment where all the men in the group are going to affirm your son in his manhood and say, now that your rite of passage is coming to a close, you are officially considered to be a man in this family, just like the rest of us. And those are the words that your son needs to hear mm. at or around his 13 year old birthday is I consider you to be a man now, just like the rest of us. Because when a boy hears that, then he doesn't have to try to prove his manhood to himself, right? Because I can say, I can speak personally because I had that exact situation. I had that exact um, moment in my own life, 13 years old at the cabin at Lake Shasta, the last ritual and my grandfather, my dad, and my uncles all telling me that I am a man now, you know, it's like your son is not going to be able to question it because I looked at all of those guys, like they're older than me, they're bigger than me. They're all married and have children and have jobs. Like there was no doubt in my mind as a 13 year old that these are men. And then there was also no doubt in my mind that they had sat me down and told me you are a man now too. So when one, when a, a, someone who's like clearly a man, a good man sits down and says, you are a man now too, there's just no way to uh, deny it. You know, it's like, yeah. it, I, I went through the benefit of it is that your son is going to go through his teenage years, knowing deep in his heart that he is a man. And that's really what the whole purpose of the weekend is, is to properly initiate our sons into manhood so that they don't have to try to prove their manhood to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And, and in our, in a culture that is so, in my opinion, confused on all the issues of who I am, who am I supposed to be being able to make that clear to him and take away that ambigu ambiguity and just make it rock solid foundation. That's, that's just an awesome way to go. So you've written a, a book. We've mentioned a couple times. I know you have you have resources online. Um, what's your website? What's your book? How do people find out more about this from you? Yeah, the best way to find out more about us is our website, which is milestone to manhood .com. You can purchase a copy of the book there. The book, the first half of it kind of talks about our family uh, tradition, how this got started, how it impacted our lives. And the whole second part of the book is really a how-to guide for fathers who want to organize a weekend uh, like this. It literally step-by-step -step tells you how you're going to do it. Another resource that we have for your listeners is on our website, there's a planning section. So you just go to the menu, hit, hit plan your own rite of passage. And what we realized is that one of the biggest hurdles for a father who wants to organize a rite of passage for his son is getting the other men involved, just explaining to, the, to them, what is a rite of passage? Why mm -hmm. do you want to hold one for your son? And what are you going to be doing, right? There's there's a lot to explain there because most guys don't really have, uh, you know, something to re reference back to because we yeah. don't have a rite of passage in our culture. So um, what we've done is we've written out email templates that you can go to our website, literally copy and paste them. And then all you have to do is paste them in a body of an email, identify three or four or five guys who you want to come on your son's rite of passage. And this email is going to explain what a rite of passage is, why you want to do one for your son and exactly what the weekend is going to look like. Um, we've, you know, we've tried to make it as easy as possible for you to organize a rite of passage event. We don't even ask for your email address. We know that guys don't want to get spammed these days. I get it. I don't want to either. So right. you literally just go to the website, copy and paste. And this, like I said, gives you the words that you need to organize a rite of passage for your son. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And, and I hope guys take advantage of the resources you, you have available. Um, in addition to, to the book that you've got and the planning you just talked about, you, you have a handful of really good articles on your site as well, which can help dig into some of these topics more. So I, I, I want guys to go there and check out what you got for sure. And Stephen, I, I really appreciate your time today. This is such a great conversation. And, and I hope that many of the people who listen, I hope they take your advice. I hope they follow the plan and I hope they hold the rite of passage for their own sons. Thank you so much, Warren. Thanks for having me. All right, man. Have a great day. You too.